My first question is, do you trust Barack Obama? I trust Barack Obama, the President of the United States, to carry out with me the policies that have joined Israel and the United States in what Barack Obama has called the unbreakable bond. We have common goals, common interests. The President fully understands them. He has shared them with me, and we now have a job to do to get on with our common goal of achieving peace with security. I, I trust we'll be able to do that together. I know you've refuted any kind of crack in the relationship, Mr. Prime Minister, but let me ask you this. What do you wish this administration had done differently from the get-go? You know, I'm sure they have wishes for me, and I'm sure I could have wishes for them, and we have ups and downs, and everybody, everybody focuses on the downs and the press magnifies them beyond belief, but people don't even notice, not merely the ups, they don't notice the bedrock of common interests that go so deep and so strong. And I had the opportunity yesterday to have a, a very important discussion with the, with the President Obama and his people, uh, and today with the, yesterday with the Secretary Clinton and today with Secretary Gates. We have a job to do, to achieve security in the Middle East, and to get on with direct peace talks between President Abbas of the Palestinian Authority and myself to achieve something that people dismiss. They think it won't happen. They dismissed it with uh, President uh, Sadat of Egypt and Prime Minister Begin of Israel, but it happened. That's the job. That is to get another peace treaty between Israel and the Palestinians to end this conflict once and for all. While you want to accentuate the positive, clearly, mm. that's part of your mission here in the United States, surely there have been disappointments with the Obama administration. Can you just be candid with me and tell me how the administration has disappointed you? You know, you, you remind me of the Israeli press. Uh, they say, how come you had a good meeting with President Obama? Well, because I did. You know, because we, we actually uh, see eye to eye on, on some central issues, the quest for peace, the danger of Iran, uh, the need to bolster security in, uh, for Israel and the region. Uh, that's the truth. We do see it. Uh, have we had differences? Of course we had. But I think Some these differences... Some awkward moments? Yeah, of course we've had. So what? Uh, it's, I mean, even they are magnified uh, and distorted. Uh, when I sit uh, across the president from the very first meeting that I had with him in a superintendent's office, by the way, in uh, the National Airport in Washington, um, we had a very good chat. Uh, and then we had five, six other meetings. There is uh, uh, an important room of the meeting of the minds. And I think, uh, I think the president has a fine mind, and I can relate to it. Can you explain this to me then? In a poll conducted a month ago, just a month ago, 71% of the Jews in Israel surveyed said they dislike President Obama. 47% expressed a strong dislike. Well, maybe they don't uh, have the opportunity to have the kind of conversations that I had. And maybe they're not aware also of the ongoing cooperation between Israel and the United States in the fields of uh, security, intelligence, uh, the fact that uh, the Iron Dome program to protect against missiles is something that has been bolstered by uh, this administration and by this president. There are a lot of things that don't fit the picture, so they're not reported. And you know that uh, sometimes there's a stereotype about him, there's a stereotype about me, and each of these stereotypes is wrong. We have a common goal to achieve a secure peace. I'm looking forward to working with him to achieve it. Well, to change public opinion in your country, should you be more strongly advocating on his behalf? You know, I invited the president to Israel. I hope that he finds uh, an appropriate time to come. I think that uh, when people get to know him and uh, First Lady Michelle Obama was very kind to my wife, they, gave us a very warm reception. I hope uh, I'll be able to, will be able to reciprocate it in Israel. At the meeting yesterday, President Obama said, quote, I believe the Prime Minister wants peace and is willing to take risks mm. for peace. Mm. That's a lot of responsibility. What risks are you willing to take? Well, I, I think I'm willing to take a lot of steps and the people of Israel yearn for peace, pray for peace. Uh, we've all lost relatives. I lost a brother and uh, the war between the wars known as terror and some people in my staff have lost relatives. Uh, we know the cost of war, and we know the, the serenity of peace that, we, that has eluded us is something we wish for and pray for, and we're willing to make sacrifices for. I have to say that with all those compromises, there's something, Katie, I will not compromise on, 
and that's Israel's security. I had the opportunity yesterday to discuss with the President in some length the real problem that we face uh, in achieving security as we go forward for the peace. When we've vacated territories in recent years, what we've seen is that Iran's proxies took over the territories and used it to fire thousands of rockets into Israel. Now the good news, Israel is bigger than Rhode Island. The bad news, it's smaller than New Jersey. So in a very small state, thousands of rockets were uh, thrown at us from areas we vacated. I said to the President that the main thing that I'm concerned with is to make sure that if we vacate additional territory, that this is not taken over once again by Iran's proxies, as happened in Lebanon, as happened in Gaza. Um, and he agreed with me. So I'm, I'm hopeful, I'm optimistic that we can fashion a security answer so that we can move on with the peace answer. There are Israeli settlements in the West Bank, Golan Heights, and East Jerusalem, and areas that have been occupied by your country since 1967. These are very controversial and have been a major sticking point in the Middle East peace process. There's been a freeze, as you well know, on new construction in the West Bank since last November, but it ends, I believe, on September 26. Your foreign minister, Avignor Lieberman, said yesterday, quote, there is no chance the freeze will be extended. Is that the final answer? Does he speak for you? Well, you know the settlement issue itself is supposed to be part of the final peace negotiations. It was always delegated to that. My government made an extraordinary gesture seven months ago. I said, listen, I'll adopt a 10-month temporary freeze in order to help the Palestinian enter the peace talks. Seven months have gone by, and they haven't entered the peace talks, and they keep raising all sorts of objections, like, will you extend the freeze that was meant to get us into the peace talks in the first place? So my answer is a very simple one. Enter the peace talks. We're going to discuss the question of settlements, their future, what stays, what doesn't stay. These issues can be brought up in the final settlement negotiations. We'll discuss it. And what if the Palestinians say, extend the freeze, and we'll have direct talks? Well, they, they, yeah, they, they say so extend the freeze. So there you go, a stalemate. No, they, well, they never said that before. For 17 years, we've been having talks, and all of a sudden, they raise this precondition. Then they raise other preconditions, all sorts of pretext excuses, and my suggestion to them is, look, we all have our grievances. We all have our issues. We all can complain about the other side. Believe me, there are many things I can talk about with the Palestinians. They call public squares uh, and after terrorists who murdered uh, hundreds of Israelis. Do I say, no, I'm not going to talk to you unless you uh, take off that square? There, everybody can bring up preconditions. My point is, the only way we resolve this conflict, the only way we end peace negotiations, is to begin them. And I call on President Abbas to meet me, uh, of the Palestinian Authority, to meet me anywhere in uh, steamy New York uh, or in uh, cooler climes or in Washington or in uh, uh, Ramallah or in Jerusalem. Let's get together and negotiate an end to this conflict. And I think we should stop looking for preconditions and excuses. Writer and columnist Tom Friedman, widely regarded as pro-Israel, says your settlement policies are the equivalent of driving drunk. He wrote that, quote, continuing to build settlements in the West Bank and even housing in disputed East Jerusalem is sheer madness. Well, he, I, I think if he was talking about those neighborhoods of Jerusalem that everybody recognizes are going to remain part of Israel, I beg to disagree. I think everybody knows that these Jewish neighborhoods that are part of the urban continuum of Jerusalem that have nothing to do with the Arab neighborhoods, people live there, they build, you don't do... You don't start ethnic cleansing in Jerusalem, neither on the Arab side or on the Jewish side. Well, let's talk about the West Bank then. Then, and I think that this is something that uh, that uh, uh, people don't understand and has been misrepresented. As far as the West Bank, the issues of settlements there has to be negotiated in the final peace treaty. That peace treaty will have to deal with our security, with the uh, end of the refugee claim, with the end of conflict. We want peace that ends the conflict, not that uh, creates a Palestinian state from which the conflict continues. And, and these are all issues that will be raised. Believe me, it will be a tough negotiation. But I'm eager to do it. You have said Israel will not apologize for the recent raid on mm. that ship that was violating uh, the barricade against Gaza, a raid that left nine pro-Palestinian activists dead. Mm. Although you have said you regret 
the loss of life. This action, as you know, was internationally condemned even by Israel's, many of Israel's allies. Still today, no regrets? No, we definitely regret the loss of life, but... Uh, no regrets for the action you took? Imagine a different story. Imagine that you were, just think about it in this uh, way, Kathy. Suppose you were Coast Guard, entered a ship, boarded a ship, and as they boarded the ship, uh, the Coast Guard was almost hacked to death, knived, pummeled with iron bars and so on, and people defended themselves. And in the course of defending themselves, uh, people get killed, tragically. Now, what would you do? Would the American president uh, Apologize. I think he would say we regret the loss of life, but we don't apologize for uh, our Coast Guard or our soldiers uh, acting in self-defense to, to keep themselves alive. And th that's basically what I've said, and I think that's a reasonable position. If you feel as if you did nothing wrong, why did you then relax the blockade? I thought before this uh, event uh, happened, I thought that, there, that it made sense to have uh, a military uh, a security envelope around Gaza because we've had thousands of rockets fired from Gaza on Israel. But I, I really thought that it didn't make sense to have uh, a, a civilian blockade. And I, my policy that I began discussing before in our uh, inner councils, I said, look, a sensible policy is weapons and war material out, food and everything else in. And we began to relax the civilian blockade before this incident happened. And when it, uh, when it took place, we accelerated this change of policy. I think it's correct. I think it's sensible. I think it's clear. Uh, but you and, did accelerate it after the incident. Yes, I did. Absolutely. You don't not do a wise decision because events uh, uh, warrant it. In fact, you carry it out. And that's what leadership has to do. You make the right decision. You don't say, well, right now, because people will say that I'm acting under the uh, influence of that incident, you don't take the right decision. In fact, we did take the right decision. Weapons out, everything else can come in. Mr. Prime Minister, have you reconsidered your assessment from early June that there is no humanitarian crisis going on in Gaza? Well, th there certainly isn't one uh, now because everything has gone through. We've multiplied the, I think we've doubled the number of trucks going in. It's soon going to triple. But did, did have you reconsidered that assessment? Do you still believe that statement was true when it, you it made was, it in early June. It, it was true then and it's true now. There's no starvation and all that. But when I said that before, people didn't believe me. You know, we increased uh, the flow of traffic before uh, the complete removal of the civilian uh, blockade. And people just didn't believe me, no matter what I said. So I, I said to the cabinet, the Israeli cabinet, I said, look, the simplest way to allow, to have people understand that anything can go in, in terms of food, medicine, toys, anything. It's just to let it go in. And we voted on it. And they all agreed. And that's what's happening. And would you agree, though, if there was no humanitarian crisis, it may be a question of semantics, that there was a great deal of human suffering going on there? I think there is suffering because uh, Gaza, the people of Gaza are held hostage by a tyrannical regime. It's one of the most backward uh, regimes in the world. It doesn't respect the rights of its people, the rights of women. Uh, the rights of gays. It's a very backward Iranian outreach. It's a terror organization that doesn't allow freedom. If the people of Gaza were free to choose, they'd kick these people out, believe me. Uh, and in the West Bank, you can see a different, uh, a different uh, government. You can see the prosperity that goes there. We've encouraged it. I've relaxed hundreds of checkpoints and roadblocks, and there's prosperity in the West Bank. There are shopping malls, coffee shops, uh, e-businesses, you name it. That's what Gaza could be like. Uh, from the point of view of, the, of letting things in, I've enabled everything to go in. But I cannot do one thing. I cannot, uh, unfortunately, change that government. The, the Palestinian people have to do it themselves. And they have a choice between an early medieval style of government that Hamas, is, the terrorist organization, is forcing on them, and a 21st century a form of government, I know what they would choose if they were free to choose. They'd actually choose what I would choose. They'd form, they'd choose pluralism and freedom uh, and peace. Uh, they're not given that choice by Hamas. I know that you have, you, you have applauded UN sanctions and sanctions adopted by the mm. United States and Europe against Iran mm. to curb that country's nuclear ambition. Mm. 
A, do you think these sanctions will actually be effective? And B, what if they're not? I think that it's important that uh, President Obama pass the UN sanctions bill in the Security Council. Not because they're strong, but because they create an international uh, an understanding that Iran is doing something illegitimate and dangerous. Secondly, I think it's important that he sign the uh, U.S. the Congressional Sanctions Bill, which is much sharper. It has a bite. Third, I hope that other nations and other leaders follow the U.S. and President Obama's lead and target hard sanctions against, primarily against Iran's energy sector. This regime basically lives off oil uh, and cannot do without the import of gasoline. If all that is done, I cannot tell you now, Katie, that it would stop the Iranian nuclear program. I can tell you that Iran is a very brutal regime. It brutalizes its own people. It sponsors terrorism left and right against my own country, against others, and it calls for the destruction of the Jewish state. Uh, I, think, I think it should not be allowed to have nuclear weapons. If sanctions are not effective, will Israel take matters into its own hands? Would there be a unilateral strike against Iran? I've taken note of uh, President Obama's statement, which he reiterated to me in this visit, that uh, the United States is determined not to allow, uh, to prevent Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons, that all options are on the table. And I, I respect that. We obviously prefer that the international action led by the United States succeed. Israel was founded to protect Jewish lives. Uh, that's really what the tragedy of the Jewish people before the State of Israel was that we had no ability to defend ourselves. We always reserve the right of self-defense. And one final question from Twitter. From Some, Twitter? Yeah, you Twitter, I understand, well, well, or you well, tweet? I'm, uh, I'm tweeted. <laughs> Do you have a lot of followers? Uh, you know, my son follows that, and he tells me that we have a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of interest. You don't seem very into it. No. <laughs> All right. Well, no. someone asked this question. Mm -hmm. uh, Mideast peace seems to be an oxymoron. Mm. We heard that a lot from people writing into us when they found yeah. out I was yeah. doing this interview. How can you give people hope? That's what they said about Prime Minister Begin and, uh, and uh, President Sadat. That said, was so uh, long ago, Mr. Uh, Prime well, Minister. Well, isn't it about time we do it again? Isn't it about time that we actually sit down? The Prime Minister of Israel, myself, with President Abbas of the Palestinian Authority, with the help of President Obama, let's sit down and let's solve this conflict. But It'll someone's going to have to make some concessions. Absolutely. So will the Palestinians. And so Israel. will you. Absolutely. Are That's you willing to do that? Yes. Yes, I am. That's what leaders are for. You don't do the easy things. You do the hard things. If you have to do just the easy things, take a pollster, but don't be a leader. If you want to be a leader, do what's right. What's right is to achieve peace and to anchor it in security. Security, as I said, is not the enemy of peace. It's the facilitator of peace. And if we get through the security issues, I think we will have, make a broad leap towards peace. And I, I'd like to defy the skeptics and all the cynics, all those who say it can't be done. I think it can be done. Your political opponent, Zippy Livni, has said you don't really understand how much the lack of a real Israeli peace proposal has hurt your country. Uh, Look, let me not argue with the opposition today, uh, and not here. You know, I think all Israelis are united in the desire to achieve peace, and I think I represent uh, this broad national desire. And you think, think you've been is. bold enough? You think you've been bold enough? I've been pretty bold, but I'm willing to be bolder, except I need a partner on the other side who sits with me, as we're doing here. Can you imagine that we're 10 minutes away, I in Jerusalem, President Abbas in, uh, in Ramallah, and we have to ask uh, our good friend, Senator Mitchell, George Mitchell, to hop from uh, the other part of the world to carry messages between us. That's, we have to live with each other. We have to make peace with each other. We should be able to talk to each other directly and soon. In fact, not soon, right now. And I know you have called for a, the creation of a Palestinian state. Mm -hmm. And you did that last year for the first time after your entire career. Mm -hmm being opposed to that. So why are you so late to the party? I wasn't opposed to uh, the Palestinians being independent from us. I don't want to govern them. Uh, I don't want them to, uh, I don't want to rule them and I don't want them to threaten us. My concern was how do we ensure 
that Israel's security is, uh, is taken care of. And I think there's a way to do it. It's been done elsewhere. It's going to be hard to do it here. Let's do it. Let's get on with it. You know, I have tried to figure out what is the possible excuse for not getting into a room and discussing peace. And you know what? There isn't any. They should come in, the Palestinians, and negotiate peace with us. And then we'll see what leaders are made of. And perhaps you'll allow me to talk with you and Mahmoud Abbas when that happens. I think President Obama will be in the room before you, but you're welcome to come in later. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Mr. Prime Minister, thanks again for your time. We really Thank appreciate you, it. Thank, Thank you. you.